Hello, I'm Angelique Polk. I'm an instructor at the Department of Neurology at Mass General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts in the U.S. And I want to thank the organizers of the Neuroscience Virtual Event, which is a part of the NIH Brain Initiative, Human Neuroscience and Cross-Cutting Impact of Scientific Collaboration, for this opportunity to discuss this work, which in this particular case, I'm going to try to convince you that high resolution or high spatial resolution electrodes can improve our understanding of the human brain, understanding of cognition and neurological pathology. Because microelectrodes are and have been used for the past 30 years to uncover secrets of the brain. They've been you know, instrumental in understanding aspects of cognition and as well as uh, neural pathologies. And here's a few examples of the different kinds of electrodes uh, in the lower left uh, portion of the slide. You see a laminar array, which is a type of, uh, looks somewhat like a thumbtack, but it actually has individual contacts that are 100 microelectric contacts that are 150 microns apart from each other. There's also the well-known neuroport array, which is also called a Utah array, which has 96 microelectrodes to sample single neuron activity. Itzhak Fried and, and his, uh, a, a large team of collaborators have actually been using microwires, which are at the end of clinical depth electrodes, to a great effect to understand uh, cognition and, and pathology. And there's also uh, you know, different types of uh, electrodes that are microgrids. And these particular electrodes are, are incredibly powerful in that they have been in, instrumental in understanding aspects of, of cognition as well as understanding uh, aspects of, say, epilepsy. It's important that you know, these particular microelectrodes have you know, resulted in these advances of understanding normal and abnormal physiology in the human brain and has already led to clinical advances in decoding handwriting in patients with severe neurological injuries or in better understanding seizures in patients with epilepsy. So really these devices are powerful and incredible uh, in the hands of clinicians and researchers to understand these, these important questions, but the technology is limited that most of these electrodes are made of metal or a very fine wire and Therefore, there's aspects that, you know, in terms of customization that they're limited by, also in the manufacture, and also in, in terms of their spatial resolution. So with regard to that, there have been huge advances in the past really decade of, you know, moving, you know, particularly in the materials and sciences that, you know, would allow us to move from the 150 micron spatial sampling to a 20 to 50 micron contact to contact spacing with improvements in customization. And these latest technologies are what I'm going to be talking about today, particularly two different uh, kinds that I'll, I'll be highlighting. But to give you a sense of the scale that I'm talking about, here is a cutout view of a hemisphere of a human brain. There's the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe here. And as we zoom in, what I'm going to actually sort of highlight is that there are you know, clinical leads, which are these larger blue bands that you actually get to sort of notice here. Uh, but closer in is these microelectrodes that I just discussed in the previous slide. The micro contacts here are highlighted as yellow. The blue bands are the larger sort of um, um, clinical leads that are normally used for understanding or, or sampling uh, seizure onset zones and epilepsy. And then the little tiny cells that you see in there are actually the neurons um, reconstructed to scale. To give you a sense of scale, that the scale of understanding cells and brain cells is much smaller than certainly the clinical leads and even smaller relative to uh, current microelectrode technology. What you also see in the middle of that figure there are neural pixels, which is one of the technologies that I'll, I'll be discussing today that affords us that much closer sort of recording and spatial mapping relative to single uh, neurons in the brain. And what we're finding, and you know, both us as, as a large consortium and team as well as uh, other uh, co um, teams in the, you know, across the world is that using the high resolution recordings in human neurophysiology could provide novel and, and important insights into normal circuits, how these circuits participate in cognition and behavior, and how these circuits are impaired in pathology. So the point of my talk today is to lay out five stories, five studies where we actually were able to demonstrate these kinds of um, aspects of, of how microelectrodes can actually improve what we understand of the human brain. Particularly, and what's amazing is that these particular uh, stories have actually come out in the past year. And so we were able to uh, identify and understand what's going on with the microscale activity using such you know, great technologies. 
And what do I mean by the different types of uh, advances in, in technology? Well, one of the technologies I wanted to highlight is a thin film recording. So these are thin film electrodes, which essentially are so thin they're usually between 7 and, and, and 15 microns thick in terms of uh, the material. They can actually lay on the surface of the cortex and can be essentially, you know, quote unquote printed in a way such that you can actually customize their design and shape. So you actually see on the right side two different examples of thin film electrodes where on the top you actually have 128 contacts made of uh, P.PSS, PSS, which is a um, type of material that allows you for um, low impedance and high resolution uh, recordings. And then on the bottom, you actually see a design for a, an electrode that has 1,024 contacts to be able to record um, neural activity across the surface of the human brain. And these contacts could also be made of platinum nanorod, which is in itself uh, low impedance, but also allows for um, microstimulation, you know, at the at the contacts as well. And these electrodes have been uh, used by us and, and various other groups to be able to sort of understand, you know, microscale dynamics and how it propagates across the surface of the brain. The other type of electrode I'm going to highlight is the neuropixels. Neuropixels has taken the world by storm, taken the neuroscience world by storm. It has been used to great effect in, in non-human primates and, and uh, rodents to be able to understand uh, underlying neural dynamics. So with regard to that, um, so to give you a sense of scale of these, uh, why microelectrodes are actually can sample uh, information that much better relative to single electrodes, I'm going to actually show you an activity represented, a simulated activity represented um, by a single electrode and the waveforms that are shown up for you know two different neurons on a single contact compared to, you know, when it actually is represented on, on the microelectrodes on a neuropixel array. In this, this video, what you'll see is that there are uh, activity represented by uh, the spikes or action potentials on the, on the left. And this particular activity is pretty hard to tell what's going on, you know, if you're just recording from a single cell. As opposed to on the neuropixels array, you have an address. You have a spatial map that is actually being represented across multiple contacts across the, the neural pixel array that, you know, this emphasizes that we can identify single cells and their substrates in terms of uh, cognition and pathophysiology. With regard to that, to even further illustrate this point, when you have more than just a single cell, you can actually observe that there are multiple, you know, reasons why microelectric sa uh, sampling and high-resolution sampling uh, help understanding uh, in understanding neural dynamics, such as, you know, in this case, I'm actually illustrating excitatory inhibitory cells, and their ongoing dynamics can be wildly, you know, fireworks effect <laughs> enabling, but they can't necessarily be sampled using low-resolution electrodes. So between the neural pixels array and the high resolution uh, thin film arrays on the top of the surface of the cortex, we can start to parse out what each of these cells are doing during you know, specific you know, important behavioral functions um, in the course of, of any type of uh, cognition or in the case of, of epilepsy or, or tumor. But I will, so would like to illustrate and, and highlight especially the teamwork that is involved in making this possible to be able to you know, understand human uh, brain activity. First off, I would like to mention Ashari Daya, who has been a major role in, 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 in making these kinds of thin film electrodes or microelectrodes available for us and, and several other groups. And he's been uh, spearheading you know, the development of thousands of, of electrode type of microelectrodes in this domain that has allowed us to ask some pretty amazing questions. I'd also thank a, a large team, and especially IMEC, which is, uh, you know, and led by um, uh, in this, this effort by Bruin Duda to move uh, a, a pretty amazing chip technologies and silicon technologies into the neural pixel array for the use, you know, by, you know, various other collaborators you can show, see on the right, but also by, you know, a number of different individuals across the country. And of course, all of this would not be possible without the help and hard work of the clinicians because Translating these devices for use in the operating room, whether the neural pixels probe or the thin film electrodes, have required years and months of development of a workflow that emphasizes patient safety and regulation requirements. You know, in the Cash Lab, we've been uh, led by both Sydney Cash and the Yang Wang Chu 
to make this, this work possible, as well as the aid and of, of a number of different clinicians that in the clinical team to, you know, to make these recordings you know, even happening in the oper operating room. Particularly since the operating room and recording neural activity in the operating room provides an amazing opportunity to be able to um, understand what is going on with human physiology. And in the operating room itself, it actually it can be explored, human physiology can be explored in a safe and ethically responsible fashion. But it comes with challenges. And in that, that particular domain, we have found that it is important to realize that there are both clinical considerations, sterilization validation, clinical workflow, and especially patient safety, as well as scaling considerations so when moving these particular devices that have been used in the um, in, uh, basic neuroscience domain into the, into the human brain. But with all of these considerations in mind, I'd like to uh, sort of convey or communicate the kinds of adv advances or in improvements in understanding of the human brain that we've been able to pursue using these microelectrodes, and especially the neuropixels and, and thin film microelectrodes to understand different dynamics in different uh, settings. With regard to neuropixel, it was a pretty amazing moment to be able to record neural activity using the neuropixel array because as I tried to communicate in the earlier videos, you'll see that you can actually follow and identify individual cells on a very fine scale using these high spatial resolution electrodes. Working with a fantastic team, we were able to identify that there are diverse waveforms that could be tracked through time um, during the uh, duration of the recording. And these waveforms represented in this slide you know, it gives just a snippet of this under, this this wide, you know, and you know, multifaceted array of different types of cell types that we may be able to uncover just through the use of these these types of electrodes. In one particular case, we were able to record 202 single cells at once to be able to identify, you know, what exactly is going on in different areas of the cortex, you know, along the different layers of the cortex. And this already has, has uncovered, you know, different aspects of the fact that across the, you know, the different cases, we we're able to observe a wide ranging diversity of, of waveforms and shapes, which allows us to have, you know, individual cell identity, but also cell cell interactions that we would not be been able to uncover without this kind of high spatial resolution. So future data collection and analyses uh, of the neuropixels uh, data could reveal a treasure trove of cell-to-cell -cell interactions and improved understanding of cell activity within the cortical column itself. And in that regard, the neuropixels alone has enabled improved sampling of the voltages such that we can observe a wide variety of cell types, which is a pretty much a launching ground you know, pad for a massive number of studies, which we hope will uncover, you know, secrets essentially of the human brain. But one thing I actually want to sort of pivot on here is that we have some amazing uh, uh, data that's you know building not from us from other groups of using neuropixels to understand spiking activity. The microscale uh, recordings them, themselves are also uh, revealing novel neurophysiological events in the human brain that we would not have otherwise been able to uncover without you know these devices. So we uh, one particular paper that we published is uh, demonstrating that we actually found we could identify and see these unitary events that would propagate across the microelectrodes using the thin film surface electrodes. And we actually see that these unitary events would be repeated, they can be clustered, they just happen to be slower or longer in duration compared to spikes or a single action potential. So the question is, what exactly are these things? Well, we for, couldn't quite answer that kind of question in the human brain, but we could also demonstrate that these, these things, these events, type two and three events, were physiological. They acted like they, you know, units, except for they were just somewhat slower. They varied with direct electrical stimulation. They were suppressed with intravenous introduction of proconvulsive medication and cold saline. They were present largely in the upper layers of the uh, cortex, in the layer one through three areas. And they actually seem to, you know, be shown in a number of other t different types of electrodes. And because we were able to observe these in so, so many different cases, uh, we were asked, you know, we're starting to ask the question of what exactly they are. Because one, you know, aspect that was pretty exciting was the fact that they varied with a particular word. They actually, um, this task developed by Dan Cleary and Eric Hallgren, 
Uh, there was a particular task where you could actually present the participant with a real word, a nonsense syllable, or a white noise kind of, kind of sound. And what was interesting is that these events increased significantly relative to the real word versus the other, you know, other sounds, already indicating to us that there is a physiological correlate or of what these, these particular events are. And the ongoing investigation will be then to examine these events relative to um, different sort of calcium dynamics or dendritic action potentials to ask, are we able to sample high resolution information that is beyond just a single action potential spikes produced around the cell body? Are these particular new novel events, you know, allow us to be able to look at, you know, cell center, cell, cell interactions or dendritic action, um, you know, you know, calcium waves that we otherwise would not have been able to sample without microelectrodes. So of course this already opens up an entire another avenue of investigation, just like how the neural pixels array did. But the thin film electrodes, you know, allows us to also sample other kinds of like mechanisms and, uh, and aspects of, of uh, in neural dynamics that we otherwise would not have been able to uncover, including the detailing the mechanisms underlying stimulation. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have we you know use the stimulation in terms of um, therapies such as in deep brain stimulation or they be able to, you know, treat or understand what's going on in, in the brain, such as with diagnoses or, or in the treatment of, of tumor, being able to remove a uh, tumor area while leaving behind functional brain area regions, such as in mapping language and motor functional regions during interoperative recordings. And in this particular example, in the figure on the left, you see sort of two long um, sort of sticks. These are bipolar stimulators that can be used um, and moved by hand by the neurosurgeon as, and then they stimulate in certain areas to be able to either arrest or change the language um, sort of, uh, of the awake patient to be able to understand where, where in the brain it is functional. This particular procedure is, is you know, consistently done and which uh, as a way to identify areas to resect and working with Aluda Malola at Moriero, we want to understand what's going on the microscale level, what is going on in the single neuron or, or local level using these microelectrodes, especially the thin film microelectrodes. So what she was able to do, which is fantastic, is use deep lab cut a computer vision uh, uh, to, a program that would allow you to actually map um, and identify the location of the stimulant electrode relative to the microelectrodes. And using this, this program, she was able to then, you know, identify the stimulation locations relative to uh, the microelectrode recording. So what you're going to see here is that, you know, basically to be able to track the stimulation and be able to uh, map it relative to the um, uh, local microscale activity, she used We are able to, uh, as you can see in this big black bar, that's when stimulation is happening. What happens a few seconds later is these large sort of uh, sort of waves or spikes that would actually happen in the microelectrode recording. In this particular case, you you can actually you know observe that you know it actually varies when the stimulation uh, location moves around to the different locations. But in this particular dynamic, you you can observe something that's a little bit different that cannot be necessary. You know, we could not find on the clinical leads. And what they are are these big propagating waves happening about you know one to two seconds after stimulation. And because we're recording with microelectrodes, we can then take a look to take a look at the um, underlying activity and the dynamics under you know relative to these these waves. Particularly we look at the single cell activity, the single unit activity. And what we found with these uh, waves were is that they were probably post inhibitor post stimulation inhibitory waves. So when we took a look at the spiking activity at the same time as these inhibitory waves, we found that the spiking activity would increase for a short bit right after uh, stimulation, but then the uh, inhibitory wave would come through and actually seem to correspond with the immediate stop of the, of the spiking activity, you know, making us think that these, this is a mechanism of, uh, of actually compensating or Basically, a shut off of overexcitability or a way, a homeostatic uh, process to be able to stop, you know, over spiking or, or overexcitation. And of course, there's huge questions with regard to this and an exciting avenues of investigation that uh, Aluda Malola will be investigating, which is 
whether when this particular inhibitory wave shows up, how do these how does this map to ongoing clinical mapping or such as in language mapping, and whether this wave could have any correspondence to you know identifying pathogenic versus healthy cortex. So therefore, this already starts to reveal an aspect of you know something that's close to mechanism that we otherwise would not be able to have without these microelectrodes regarding you know how stimulation affects the human brain, especially in this clinical domain. Of course, there's other functions and other aspects of behavior that you know that are really important to understand, which is also tracking uh, in this instance sensory motor activity in, the, in high spatial resolution. And this is work uh, entirely done um, by. O Oregon Health Sciences University and, and Dr. Raslin and team uh, in a paper that also was recently published by Yang Bing Cho, where we took a look at, I mean, they took a look at uh, ongoing motor activity. And what you're going to see in this, uh, this video is a recording from a 1024 channel grid. And what these arrows in, in the different sort of waves are going to be indicating is, is you know, beta waves that are propagating from different uh, directions, such as the uh, sensory motor uh, sort of strips, and what happens as a person actually grips their hand and then releases their hand, and how it can actually just propagate across this high-resolution grid. Now imagine that basically instead of this 1,024 uh, grid to be able to record this kind of activity, a lot of the clinical leads are generally between four to eight contacts over a you know, much wider space. So this already gains a, you know, a huge amount of information regarding the, the you know, intricacies and the dynamics of how the brain you know, can produce a movement and a behavior. So this kind of tracking, and as well as a number of different functions that uh, the uh, Young Cho and others had actually sort of uncovered using this kind of like a thousand channel recordings could you know, open up an entire array of understanding uh, you know, human brain activity, but also brain machine interfaces in the case of individuals who are paraplegic. And of course, there's also an aspect that is a huge portion of why and how we uh, sort of address these questions of, of pathophysiology, because an aspect of this work is to, you know, we are approaching patients that are undergoing uh, clinical surgery in the first place, and we want to be able to better understand the particular reasons they're there, such as uh, epilepsy or tumor, and that, in particular, has been you know that effort is, has been led by Dr. Sidney Cash and Dr. Jimmy Yang and Dr. Priya Swami here, of understanding and using microscale electrodes to understand pathophysiologies, particularly epileptiform activity in the human brain, because there are certain signatures, there are certain physiological signatures of of areas or, or tissue that is known to um, uh, if you basically, you know, known to be able to correlate to, say, seizure onset zones or be near tumor. And these particular neurophysiological signatures are often sampled at low resolution. I showed you earlier a, a image of the clinical lead. It, it is much larger relative to these microelectrodes. And so the question is whether or not these microelectrodes could be able to help us understand interactive discharges, which are these large sort of, you know, spike-like things that are much larger in duration, so 250 mi uh, milliseconds in duration, or high-frequency oscillations, both of which have been correlated with areas that are uh, uh, areas of tissue that are pathogenic. And so, in this paper with, uh, that led by Dr. Uh, Yang, the question was whether or not the identification of the location, direction, and propagation of these these um, pathogenic signals may be important with regard to uh, surgical planning and treatment. So what he was found with this uh, a data set of, of 31 participants is that there was actually a propagation, a path that interactive discharges in particular uh, took across the, the electrode array, which could only be sampled using microelectrodes. And that path was repeated. There's actually clusters of, of, of activity that would actually happen over and over again, which, again, you would not be able to identify um, this kind of information, which, you know, because the, there are paths, the great part is that means there may be sources to be able to sort of hunt back down to and to be able to, you know, trace along the, the surface of the cortex using the thin film surface array. The other uh, discovery he, he uh, uncovered in this particular paper was that there were high-frequency oscillation hotspots. There are basically regions of the cortex that seem to consistently produce these, these little um, sort of buzzes, you know, so to speak. 
which you know again could be localized to about 200 300 microns in diameter with a, across the cortex sampled using these microelectrodes and to really kind of convey and communicate why you know once again why this scale matters in the same size of array and this is on this sort of summary diagram on the right where you can actually across in, a, in the array you can de detect intertwinal discharges and their propagation you can identify local hot spots of high frequency oscillations and we also found in, in this, this study that there could be micro seizures, which are huge seizure-like events, but only occurring with a, within an area, like a surface area of like a you know, radius of 100 microns, which is incredible. All that information is then, you know, in a, with a microelectrodes and sampled with a microelectrodes is all is not accessible using the clinical lead, which you know is shown on the top here as that big circle. All that information would be summarized into one uh, single trace, which this already tells us that we're gaining, we are gaining useful information, including clinically relevant information with regard to the human brain using these microelectrodes and the cinefilm uh, devices. But of course, there's a huge question, which is what could be occurring with a single unit activity during these events? And that is an important question with regard to um, understanding what cells are driving epileptiform activity versus what cells are not. And we had an opportunity to be able to record in a different case uh, using the neural pixels uh, electrode, single unit activity, and, and identify what's going on with, with single cells relative to interruptible discharges. And we found some cells did actually sort of increase their firing right at the peak of the interruptible discharges. Other cells were actually inhibited. So this may already start to uncover sort of cell-cell interactions and dynamics that we otherwise would not have been able to um, uncover using a, a larger electrodes or lower resolution electrodes. So in summary, I hopefully was able to you know, you know, convince you that high, increased spatial resolution is a powerful and useful tool that we can actually st start to use to identify a wide variety of single cell types that, you know, beyond single cells, a variety of neural activities can be revealed through higher spatial sampling and their, you know, cell cell interactions, particularly under, uh, you know, you know, in the aspect of what happens during stimulation, um, which is used therapeutically and, and you know, in the treatment of, of a number of disorders, but there's still major questions about what exactly stimulation is doing with uh, neural activity. Of course, there's also a we can track sensory motor activity and look at behavior and cognition. And you know, a major direction of this this work is also to discover single neuron contributions to pathological activity and ask whether or not these improvements in the technology may actually lead to better clinical outcomes, such as identification of of uh, sort of tumor and tumor infiltration using electrophysiology at this high micro. Uh, you know, sampling scale. So in the end, you know, the next big steps are not just the fact that, like I just laid out several projects, which are major launching grounds for, you know, you know, years of, of you know, in fascinating and, and exciting, you know, investigation. But also that these studies and studies from other groups have repeatedly shown that higher resolution approaches, especially when applied to human questions, have revealed important detailed information about physiology. This has been a major motivation for several of our publications where we're not only discussing our findings, but offer advice and lessons learned. And our recent Nature Neuroscience paper was a example of that where we wanted to be able to communicate what worked, what didn't, and, what, and be able to enable groups across the, you know, the neuroscience community to be able to sort of uh, work in this space. So that more groups could pursue this line of questioning as well as share the de-identified data on public uh, data repositories such as Dryad and Dabby. And to push this even further, I look forward to contributing to a massive shared microscale electrophysiological data repository such as that we as a community can possibly answer fundamental questions of cognition and address mechanisms of treatment of neuropathologies in this incredible era of neuroscience discovery. And all of this would not have been possible without a huge and massive team. I've highlighted some of the people here, but this has been a true effort of, you know, gargantuan proportions and a huge thanks to the patients who participated in these studies. 
they are the heroes of these studies in that in every single way they actually their time and their help in this can allow us to you know lead to new and better discoveries and hopefully clinical in in interventions in, in all of these neurophysiological um, or neuropathological uh, diseases. Thank you very much.